Welcome to Introduction to Criminal Liability. Today we'll be looking at digital evidence of liability. A few points of disclaimer. Uh, if you haven't read these yet, go ahead and hit pause, read them over. Basically, this is just an introduction to the law. We're focused on Maryland and United States federal law, and I am going to be using the word digital a lot. A digital forensics analyst might look into traditional crimes committed using a digital medium. They might look into digital evidence of non-digital crime. And they might look into liability unique to the digital context. I think I've covered most areas there. Well, what are traditional crimes committed using a digital medium? Well, a traditional crime is a crime that could be committed without a computer. However, it is possible to commit most crimes using one. So how might you commit a traditional crime using a computer? How about murder? Well, a lot of hospital equipment is run with uh, computer systems. You could use that to murder someone. Uh, similarly, airplanes use electronic navigation. You could use that to murder someone. What about theft? Well, theft is a little bit more straightforward. You have phishing, you have man in the middle attacks, etc., etc. And then extortion has been all the rage with ransomware and cyber exploitation. Uh, where people have uh, information about you and they either won't release it to you unless you pay them or unless you do something they will release it. Then we have digital evidence of non-digital crime. Just because a crime is committed in the real world doesn't mean that a digital forensics analyst has nothing to contribute to the investigation. On the contrary, we give out more digital evidence every minute of the day than existed at all a hundred years ago. You might have things like cell site location information, or CSLI, uh, GPS or geotags that you're putting on your social media, text messages, emails, etc. And then we have liability that's unique to the digital context that only exists using a computer. Things might include the CAN Spam Act, again, I don't know why that's first, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, unlawful access to stored communications, illegal access, the state version of unlaw unlawful access to stored communications, electronic harassment, the DMCA, etc. Now, as we saw in an earlier video, a crime is committed when all of the elements of the crime are satisfied. You have the actus reus, the mens rea, and attendant circumstance. Well, what digital evidence might be uncovered from the actus reus of a crime? Well, you have things like location information showing that the person was there. You have photographs and videos also showing that the person was there and what they were doing. You have logs, computer logs, account logs, network logs, showing how they were using a computer, where they were sending information, where they were receiving information from, etc. Now, what digital evidence might be uncovered from the mens rea of a crime? So how do we know what someone was thinking or why they were committing a crime? Well, you can look at the content of their text messages, the content of their emails, the content of their social media. These things help let you look inside their head and see their motivation for doing whatever it was that they did. And finally, you have the attendant circumstance, those extraneous qualities related to a crime. Things like when something happened, what the properties of a thing were, who did it belong to, uh, where things were stored. Things like that might be related to the attendant circumstance, and all of them involve digital evidence. Now, the job of a forensics analyst is not just to uncover evidence, it's also to prepare it for use in court. Things that need to be considered include preservation of the evidence, chain of custody, discovery or disclosure, and your expertise. So starting with preservation of evidence. In order for evidence to be admissible, you will need to show that there is a reasonable probability that no tampering occurred. The evidence presented must be in substantially the same state as when you found it. So how could you accomplish this? Well, you could use things like a checksum or a hash to show that the integrity is still intact, but you're going to need to back that up with the chain of custody showing that that checksum or that hash wasn't modified. So you could use a checksum or a hash to show that whatever digital content is the same as later on, but that's not the end of the preservation issue. After all, if you did a checksum on something after it was modified, it's going to be the same when you present it in court. The issue is making sure that no one can modify the, court, the, the original data in the first place. So you keep a chain of custody. A chain of custody is a log of everyone who handled the evidence and includes procedures employed to prevent unauthorized or undocumented access. This helps demonstrate that the evidence you present in court 
is in fact the same evidence that you recovered on the date in question. The next issue is discovery. Discovery is the name given to the process by which parties to a criminal case or a lawsuit exchange or obtain information. The evidence you recovered and the method by which you recovered it will be disclosed in discovery. So that's also the period when someone else recovers evidence where you might get brought in as a defense expert to refute what they found. This came to light with a Fourth Circuit opinion. Uh, in a criminal obstruction of justice case related to a defendant deleting incriminating emails, the defendant, uh, Rand, hired an expert to refute the government's claim. Now, the government had claimed that he deleted 3,200 emails during this uh, five-day period. And Rand brought in an expert to show that 2,500 of those emails were not actually deleted. Now, that did still leave 700 emails unaccounted for, but because the defense expert had done such a good job showing that uh, the government's case was overstated, the government dropped their expert from the witness list. They halted all their efforts to prove that these things had been deleted, and they moved to strike parts of the indictment related to those deletions. So even though there were 700 emails unaccounted for, because the government's witness was discredited by the defense expert, government didn't go forward on that charge. Now, for someone to give an opinion based on knowledge beyond that of an ordinary person, what you might refer to as a lay person, that person must be admitted as an expert. Well, what makes you an expert? So we have Maryland Rule 5-702, which you can take a look at if you want with the link below, and that rule guides the court in determining whether or not someone will be admitted as an expert. First, the court needs to decide whether the witness is qualified by their knowledge, their skill, their experience, their training, or their education. Want to hit all five of those if you can, but if you're strong in one and a little bit weaker in another, that might make up for it. The second thing the court's going to look at is the appropriateness of the expert testimony on the particular subject. Is expert testimony needed, and is this expert testimony needed? Finally, was there a sufficient factual basis to support expert testimony? So you may be the best expert in the entire world in a subject, but if there's nothing underlying your, your expert opinion, then it's just speculation, and that's not going to be admissible. Now, because digital forensics is based on a scientific technique or a method, the Fry-Reed test comes into play. And the Fry-Reed test is a test that's used in Maryland when it comes to scientific techniques. The first question is, is this a novel scientific technique? And novel means, has this technique been accepted by the appellate courts before? So it's not, has this ever been presented in court? It's, is it novel? Has it ever been accepted by the courts generally? Now, if it is novel, then the question is, has it been generally accepted by the scientific community as reliable? And when it looks at the scientific community, we're looking at publications, associations, things like that. Uh, that's where all those credentials and whatnot come into play. And we're asking if something's reliable, we mean, is it accurate? Is it reproducible? Has it been standardized, et cetera? So what does this mean? This means that as a digital forensics analyst, you need to be able to locate digital evidence, very important. You need to be able to retrieve it intact without modifying it. You need to preserve it. You need to give an expert opinion about the evidence to an attorney. After all, you have to get hired somehow. You need to explain in court how you did what you did and what makes you qualified to do what you did. In addition, you're going to need to be able to explain in court the acceptance of your technique in the scientific community and its reliability. Finally, a good witness will be able to explain on the stand the significance of what they did. Not just how they did it, but what that means. And if you can do that, then that makes you a much more valuable witness. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.